Okay, welcome back from the break. Um, I'm very happy to introduce to you Nils Norman, uh, who's the next speaker on the program. Nils Norman is professor at the School of Walls and Space at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen and works across the disciplines of public art, architecture and urban planning. Nils Norman exhibits and generates projects in collaborations in museums and galleries internationally. He has completed a major public art project, a pedestrian bridge and landscaping project for the city of Roskilde in Denmark and participated in various biennials worldwide and has developed as well commissions for, among other places, the Sculpture Center uh, at Long Island City, New York, London Underground, Take Modern Creative Time in New York City, and the Center d'Art Contemporain in Geneva. At the moment, he is developing two small-scale urban fo farming parks in The Hague that test and question the limitations and potentialities of permaculture as a possible citywide alternative design strategy for urban centers. Today, he'll speak under the title Utopia, it's here if not now. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Thank you. And um, what I'm going to show you this afternoon, or try and show you, is a, a kind of an overview of a notion of a praxis, an art praxis, which is not necessarily um, to do with making autonomous art objects, but maybe looking at the whole of all the aspects that you do as an artist, including, or as a human being. That includes teaching. Um, it includes um, all the different things that I'm going to show you, research, so on. And for me, these are very important and things that should be foregrounded parts of a kind of creative process. They're not separate. Teaching is not a separate thing. It's not a money job. It's actually part of a praxis. And this painting um, of heaven and hell for me is kind of a, embodies a lot of things that I enjoy and work with, in, with Utopia. It has a play, it's playful, it's very playful. Um, there's a kind of sensuality to it. Um, it's, there's a pastoral, it's about the garden, which I find um, very intriguing. Um, and Utopia for me as, a, as an artist is um, one element of a kind of a body of res different types of research that I um, thread through my practice. What I do is I develop strands of research which are basically satellite around notions around uh, or ideas and issues around public space. And one of those th one of those strands is utopia. For me, utopia is primarily a a critical tool. It's a, a kind of analytical tool that I use, or kind of a lens, if you like, to um, look at look at um, sites, situations, um, uh, problems, and to and in kind of way that Richard was alluding to, to reveal what's what's lacking or what's um, to critically reveal what's not there. The idea of a, a kind of end product in a utopian end product for me is not very interesting. It's actually for me maybe a rather problematic um, notion of utopia. It's actually more the journey, the process, which is very important part of utopian thinking, this journey towards somewhere, which you probably will never get to, but that journey, that sense of becoming, is the most important and most political aspect of utopia. So utopia doesn't really exist, has never existed. It's more of a, it's more of a journey, it's more of a, a transition. These are just uh, very, uh, you, you'll probably be sick of the word utopia by tomorrow. But <laughs> this is, <laughs> this <laughs> um, and these images as well, yeah. <laughs> but um, I think what's important for me is, I'll skip through those quite quickly. Um, what's important for me is this idea of utopia and how the way that utopia appears in certain um, projects uh, social projects in terms of um, particularly gardening, but also, and I'll get to this a bit later, 
things to do with urban planning. I mean, utopias are very much, m mainly utopias uh, based uh, are urban projects, they're urban ideas, but they always have a kind of gardening element to them. There's always some kind of like pastoral element to them, but it's primarily a walled garden. It's an urban garden. It's not like the countryside. It's really a, an enclosed urban, almost like city-like space or a garden within a city. Fourier, Ch this is Charles Fourier, he, um, uh, those of you that know his writing, he developed a very detailed system, social system, um, quite, um, some of most of it's quite absurd, quite f uh, fantastical, but there are things in it that I find very intriguing, particularly um, in terms of um, collectivity and um, an idea of communization I think there are things in utopian ideas that you can actually take from to build other types of utopias. And I think that's the history of utopia has always done that. Utopias are always referring to other utopias. Um, even the original utopia is kind of referring back to uh, a kind of nostalgia to a, uh, a pre-industrialized state or so on. They're always referring to another f um, existing or past idealized way of living and they're not necessarily, they are forward thinking, but they're all very, very, um, very much um, situated in the past as well. Um, I'll get back to um, Charles Fourier, but um, I, I just actually find his writing and his ideas very intriguing and they're very, for me, they kind of link very closely to ideas of, of what uh, Richard Florida is generating in terms of a, a notion of the creative industries and the creative class and how they might work together to form a kind of a new society. Uh, not, that's not necessarily a good thing, um, but I think looking at former utopias and looking at how, um, like I said, in piecemeal, they can be kind of disassembled and reassembled in some other way is a very interesting tool. And that's one of the reasons why I use utopia as a, uh, within, uh, at art school <coughs> teaching, because you can actually take very, you know, you can actually utilize certain aspects of utopia, not all of them, but you can actually take apart little details and possibly use them um, in the way that you live your life, but also in the way that you teach or the way that you make art and so on. Um, again, going back, utopia, like I said before, is very primarily a kind of urban phenomena. It's Ebenezer Howard's um, Garden City Plan, one of the earliest ones. Also, um, the whole, um, Medieval, uh, or just slightly after the medieval period, the, 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 uh, during the Reformation, the utopian groups that came out, the kind of proto-anarchistic utopian groups that came out of that moment, like the diggers, the ranters, the ravers, they for me are also very important um, in terms of how they decided to live their lives, but also the political struggle, the political, s the history of that struggle, which to certain effects has kind of been um, forgotten, not necessarily forgotten, but has been kind of sidestepped for other, for other types of histories. Um, that are in, um, for me, that these kind of social struggles, um, particularly also related to feminism, are um, very important. This idea of, of uh, history from below, these movements are very much part of that um, uh, idea. And, the, and that is another aspect of utopia which I find very intriguing, um, this, the sort of social struggle element to it. Herland, um, I don't know if you've ever, the, one of the big problems about utopian novels is they're extremely boring to read. <laughs> in, in the main, most of them are very, very boring to read. Uh, they're full of lists, they're full of incredibly uh, banal details. Um, Herland, for me, is very interesting. It's one of the first um, kind of, it's one of the first utopian um, ideas um, published by a woman. And it's actually, if you look closely at it, it's actually a, a, a permaculture. The idea is actually based around um, a, um, a forest, a very um, sustainable agroforestry system. And that's very intriguing for me in, in projects that I've been trying to develop um, around the ideas of permaculture. And I'll come back to permaculture later, if, for those of you that don't know what it is. But that just to touch on Herland, and again, touching this idea of using different utopias to take ideas from as a kind of, a, as, as a toolbox of different ideas and notions, not necessarily looking at the whole of the utopia, 
but just taking them apart and taking out small aspects of them. Very interesting descriptions of, of clothes in Herland, for example. Um, the, the special clothes that the women wore in this, in this paradise um, are very intriguing and also very kind of uh, possibly quite, quite useful to, to make now. Ecotopia, of course, is a very um, important uh, novel which came out, also interesting, out of a kind of more um, um, a real utopian mo moment um, that was developed by um, Stuart Brand um, in the 60s. Stuart Brand was, of course, the, um, the founder and one of the editors of the Whole Earth Catalog, which was a kind of, in a sense, the Whole Earth Catalog was kind of precursor to the internet. Uh, it's a huge kind of newspaper-style book of information about tools, about um, how to make things, how to do things. And he also, also set up a kind of chat room, uh, kind of a proto-internet type um, network um, after doing um, the Whole Earth Catalog. One of the things about the whole, whole Earth Catalog, for him, that was a problem, was that it became too successful. It was a utopian project that became so successful and it made too much money that he actually turned his back on it. But with that money that he made, he um, basically funded something called the Point Foundation, which is pretty much a sort of early form of venture capitalism, where he would, um, he with a group of uh, fellow hippies, would um, look at um, um, America, what US wide, they would send out kind of scouts, they would pay scouts, to their, basically their friends, to go out and search for interesting ecological and utopian projects. And one of the, one of the things that was, found f was funded by, this, uh, by, this by the Point Foundation was this book. And so you see di direct links between these kind of different utopian impulses where something actually real actually comes out of it, and something very important comes out of it, uh, and also social, socially transformative. Um, you can also see that, for example, um, going back a bit to um, Olmsted, the, um, the designer of Central Park in New York, who is credited to have having um, spent time um, at the um, Fourier um, inspired commune um, in upstate New York. And from that experience had come back to kind of put those ideas into his design for Central Park. And so for me, these socially transformative aspects of utopia are really um, are very important and very interesting and things that you can really use um, in terms of uh, f uh, utopia for me isn't kind of a dead thing. It's actually very much a live thing um, and a very, very useful thing very transformative thing. Um, this is also a kind of utopian classic, uh, Alicia Bay Laurel, her book, Living on the Earth. Um, I don't know if you've ever read, it's all hand-drawn, and it describes every aspect of your life, from how to bury someone, how to, um, how to actually help someone give birth. It's a kind of quite fascinating, detailed book, but again, extremely hippie-fied. <laughs> And again, where here you see, um, this is uh, from the, this is kind of the moment for me, and also um, it's been written, there's a very good book called um, uh, Imagination. And there in the imagination, it's a, se a se selection of essays about um, the kind of split of a uh, utopian thinking um, in the 70s uh, into a kind of more politically active process, a more sort of politically transformative activity where the student movement split away from the hippie movement um, and the hippies kind of went off and did the kind of farming and more past pastoral type things and the student movement developed um, into more slightly more um, kind of um, militant type things and uh, this book describes how that was basically kind of an end of uh, the idea of utopia that moment that split which is you know an arguable idea but it's a very interesting uh, book. So permaculture is, like many different types of biodynamic systems, they actually come out of utopian tradition. Um, they come out of this idea of if we can get back to the garden, uh, everything, you know, social problems will be solved in terms of like you know, organic farming, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, permaculture is another one, of course. And um, the others, I, you, you can reel off a list of these different things. M most of them actually were developed from the 70s, um, some of them a little bit earlier from the Labens Reform Movement. But permaculture, um, in a nutshell, is basically a, a gardening, a biodynamic gardening system, which basically creates a kind of a, a, t a totally productive system um, through a s basically design. You design, you design a space for it to be s totally self-sufficient and self-sustainable uh, by looking at it, um, by looking at um, the ecology of it, the weather, uh, the animals that use it, the people that, that so on. It's uh, looking at all aspects of the site, it's very site specific, and redesigning that space in order to kind of create um, an optimal environment for growing and being sustainable. That includes energy as well, producing your own energy. The transition town movement actually comes out of that permaculture tradition. Uh, there's a lot of problems with the transition town movement. It comes out of this, one of their big um, ideas is this idea of peak oil, where basically we've run out of oil and we're now just going downhill. And how do we actually live with that kind of acceleration downhill? And the transition town movement believes that through this return to the garden, through this utopian return to paradise, will somehow solve these problems. And I I'm, I'm, of course, very critical of these things. Um, but again, I'm also fascinated by them. I'm fascinated by their utopianism, but also about the solutions that they're trying to develop and build. Um, another important aspect of what I do, is or, or <coughs> of, my th of the way I think, is through is anarchism. And anic there's a very, like someone had mentioned earlier um, today, anarchism has a very strong utopian tradition within it. Um, this book uh, by Colin Ward is a very interesting book in terms of its chapters are all dealing with a different type of, a different part of kind of social <laughs> structure and it's explained very in detail but also very simply how those things might be, how those parts of society might be transformed using kind of anarchistic means. Um, going back to the city, urban planning, um, this, for me, is a very utopian project um, set up by Aldo van Eyck, the, um, the, the head of the municipality of Amsterdam. He was the urban planner for Amsterdam. <coughs> um, I think he started his job in 49 and ended in 72 or something. And his idea was to actually take all these surplus spaces that you see here, um, these <coughs> surplus city spaces, and put playgrounds on them. And at that time, that was actually quite a radical thing to do. And he, by by taking all these surplus spaces, he created a kind of network of playgrounds that linked together, um, creating um, an, another space for children, basically, which didn't exist before in the city. These, if you look at these playgrounds, um, this, this uh, is a very good book about uh, Aldo van Eyck, actually maps all the playgrounds that were, were in Amsterdam. There, was, there were hundreds of them. Um, not, not very many of them exist anymore because these types of playgrounds are now considered lethal in terms of health and safety. Um, constant is also another important kind of thread th of situationism um, th of my uh, research and my ideas of, uh, of a kind of notion of a praxis. Um, constant was a, uh, a kind of meta-architect. He, he only built this object, which is a, pl a playground, a sort of play a pl piece of play sculpture, structure. But he didn't actually make very much, he didn't make anything actually. Um, he was a painter and he kind of latched onto this uh, utopian idea of New Babylon, which was this sort of superstructure that would sit above cities. Once people, once, in, once machines took over work, people uh, would live in this kind of uh, above uh, the city system of walkways and, and, uh, and skywalks and, and um, they would kind of play together. They would exist together in a playful existence through situations. If you look at that now, it looks like a kind of Rem Coolhouse designed mm -hmm. airport. I mean, so I in effect, it's actually a very dystopic idea. And he actually, by the 70s, he, um, he actually kind of stopped. He made these models for decades, and they're very detailed. Some of them actually, the films that he made with his son, they look actually very real um, once they've sort of panned through the model. But he kind of renounced that idea and he started going here we went back to painting, still alive and he still makes paintings. They're sort of like Francis Bacon type paintings of people in this kind of environment. Um, but it's just an aside. So 
my, um, from this idea of looking at constant, looking at play, looking at um, utopian ideas, I began to, began to look at the, the idea of the adventure playground. And the adventure playground is a type of playground that comes out of the free play movement. It's actually s the first adventure playground uh, officially was um, made in um, a suburb of Copenhagen. And it's a they're very specific types of play spaces. They're spaces that allow children to actually build and design the space, the, play, the playscape. And this is, I think this is in Hellerup, um, in the sort of shadow of the new uh, modernist social housing built that's being built in, the, in the suburbs of Copenhagen. The children are kind of creating their own environment. Um, this is uh, also, um, this is Ballerup, as it says. And as you can see, the playground has a very specific type of design. It was actually uh, CTH Sørensen, the, um, the Danish landscape architect, who saw children playing on, bomb site, on uh, building sites and construction sites and realized that he sort of decided, his idea was to kind of institutionalize that because he thought that maybe it was a little bit too dangerous. And how, but, how, but it's a very good idea, it was a very good, uh, it, was a, it was kind of a good, great way for children to play but how could you kind of create a more safe environment for them? So he actually made this kind of idea of an adventure playground, a junk playground, from observing children doing what they did naturally. And this playground is, these play types of playgrounds, they still exist. Um, not, there aren't so many in Denmark anymore, but there are, there are a lot in London. There are a lot in Japan, and there are some amazing ones in Germany. And I'll just get through, go through that very quickly. This, for example, is um, these playgrounds. Children would come in in the spring. They would build. They would be given stacks of wood, junk, whatever. They would build the playground. And then in the autumn, they would everything would be taken down and they would leave for the winter. And um, the, the playground was hidden by an earthwork so that they would actually, by a mound, so they would be, they could play more sort of in private, sort of unobserved. Um, so my research look has begun to look into, or what I've been doing, has been looking into these playgrounds and how they wha how what they look like now, and in London um, they still exist. They're very popular spaces. They're not because of health and safety. They're not actually they're not built by children anymore. Children aren't allowed to use tools um, <laughs> in these spaces. <laughs> <laughs> they they did before. Um, there used to also be fire was very important. Water was very important, but now um, all because of health and safety, that's kind of been removed from the equation. Um, they're still extremely, um, uh, like I said, extremely popular place. They're very safe places to play, and they offer a kind of diversity uh, um, in terms of a pu an idea of a public space. They're very, di they're very diverse spaces. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a seesaw for children with um, special needs. So it's actually, you, you're, you're the children lie, maybe 15 children lie on this um, structure, and they seesaw together. This is called an around the world. And one of the things about these structures is that the most successful ones are the most social structures. So the more kids that can play together at one time, the more successful they are as play structures. And this is called an around the world where you can have 25 kids together, um, either watching and swinging together on these structures. This is a playground in North London. Um, this is a volunteer-based playground called Shakespeare's Walk where the children actually still do use tools to build the structures. I thought this is in Germany, and in Germany uh, they have di slightly different laws, so children are still allowed to make things like this, where you can see that this is, the this is actually the what you see here is a playground, and it's basically it's a kind of construction site, and it's very interesting culturally how different playgrounds offer a kind of different idea of playing, and, in, in, um, and that has a lot to do with the adults, of course, but also the children. Um, there's no swings or roundabouts in this playground. Um, it's and the children don't really build things like that. It's more a construction site of uh, building tunnels, houses, um, tree, t tree houses, and so on. They're very layered spaces. They have um, lots of different kind of levels, and most of it's actually above ground, so you can't, I mean, off the ground, so you, can't, you don't need to actually walk on the ground. Um, this is th most of these are well each G when you visit a German city they usually have two or three three of these types of playgrounds and they're very um, they're very large and most of them in the inner city. And what interests me about these types of playgrounds is that they're on very valuable urban space. Um, they 
and yet they represent an idea of kind of that they're they're a sort of urban planners, uh, property developers dream, but they represent an idea of a sort of non, non a situation, non planning or undevelopment, which I find is a very interesting kind of paradox and um, contradiction in terms of urban space. A lot of them are being closed because of that, because they're worth millions of pounds, but um, they still try and fight to keep them open. So tunneling is very important, for example, on this. <laughs> um, fire uh, was very important, and also here you see they're very porous spaces that in, in the UK, they're heavily fortified. It's a, actually very difficult to enter them without a child. But in Germany, you can just walk in. And in Japan, it's even more extreme uh, where there's no fence at all. Um, and we could maybe talk about that later, why the, those cultural differences. But um, p c composting, um, gardening, um, they're very, very important. Making food, cooking, they're very important aspects of these playgrounds as well. They're very sort of pedagogical educational spaces. And in Germany, that's why children are still allowed to use tools, because they're, cons they're not considered playgrounds. They're, con they're considered pedagogical spaces, or teaching spaces. This, I, this is a plan um, I saw of a playground in Germany, which I, I liked very much. Um, it gave, it's an, a very anarchistic idea of, of urban planning, where you basically, once you've built your building yourself, you actually just chalk it up on the map. And then when it falls down or you pull it down, you just rub it out again. <laughs> and I thought th that as a sort of idea of a transitional kind of ground up um, planning system was very interesting. This is a playground in Sweden. And this is a very a unique playground because it's, it's basically the size of a football field. It's kind of based on a grid. And it's primarily used by young girls. And they keep what they do is they, the playground is primarily for rabbits. and they they basically keep and play with their rabbits in this playground. And they also build their own structures as well, as you can see. It's a very beautiful place. So this is Japan. And Japan has, a very, again, a very different kind of eth eth ethos in terms of play and play <coughs> adventure playground. This is a kitchen. Uh, this is basically in a muni municipal park. So it's like a normal city park. And you just walk into this space, this other zone of complete um, kind of child-built um, environment. Um, they, the children cook together with, with uh, their parents, but also the people that work there. These, these places actually have adults working in them, which actually make them very expensive um, types of spaces for a city, um, because unless they're volunteers, um, you have to actually pay someone to play it, to be there, which is kind of uh, not very good for the city. And as you can see, um, this, this, there's no wall at all. It's like a basically a completely open space. The, um, you can just walk through the park. The, bu the bikes there um, are just part of the park. Um, this, is a, this is the toolkit um, for the playground. So you have, mach you have bamboo machetes, uh, gouges, um, pliers, uh, blades, and so on. And this is, op this is freely accessible to people in the park to use um, to build things. This is a, a water slide, um, kind of home-built water slide. This is a very beautiful, uh, this is in a suburb of Tokyo. It's a very beautiful um, playground built into a bamboo forest. And again, here you have a playground that is comp just in the middle of this public space in, in Japan where there's no, there's no barriers, there's no dif different space um, defined. It's, um, it's just part of the landscape of the urban landscape. And here's a very simple um, rope um, climbing frame. This actually reminds me of Robert Smithson's partially buried woodshed. Um, but it's a, it's a above ground tunnel system. And that also in playgrounds, there's a very strong, there was a very strong tradition of artists working with playgrounds um, in the 50s that died because uh, of health and safety. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, this is actually a, a Samanaguchi um, uh, huge park that he designed, uh, and he didn't finish it before he died, but um, it was finished by his uh, estate. And you have to bike through it, it's so huge. And he, all of the structures are play structures, they're also his sculptures. And they, this, this idea of artists actually making and designing building playgrounds together with children or together with other architects, that tradition has died. Um, 
it possibly might be coming back again, but um, there are certain, I, it, the funny, the, one of the interesting things about the art world is that you can actually, within art, you can actually achieve things that you might not necessarily be able to achieve through um, different, uh, to, uh, through other sectors. These are just some of his structures. So, again, going back to uh, uh, art practice, um, that research that I do feeds into different projects that I make. I wouldn't necessarily say that what you just saw is artwork. It's more of an idea of a process and or an idea of a praxis. Um, also, the other photos I'll show you of uh, different workshops and things, I don't see that as my artwork per se. It's actually a, full, it's a, it's a, a part of a process, part of a method, a methodology. Um, this is a sculpture I made um, some years ago now, actually, in the early 90s, um, parts of New York City. I lived in New York for most of the 90s, and uh, parts of that city were being redeveloped by the mayor at the time. And what I, did, what I looked, I looked at those sites that were being looked at and redesigned them kind of in for alternative methods. And this is, a, at the time, Tompkins Square Park was being redesigned. Um, they had removed a homeless city that was there at the time, and they redesigned it so it's actually much easier to control. So this sculpture, um, proposes a kind of utopian um, idea of a, a monument to civil disobedience whereby the people that use the park, um, there are structures built into it, sculptures are built into it, where they will then um, be able to avoid the curfew of the park and they can occupy it. Um, there are structures that actually prevent them from being removed by the police. Of course, this, this monument will never be made. Um, it's a purely a, a kind of utopian idea of a proposal of um, revealing certain things about the park. This is something I did for Creative Time um, uh, last year, I think, on Governor's Island. And Governor's Island is, is a, an island uh, d just off the financial district downtown um, in Manhattan, New York. And they want to redevelop it for sort of a luxury housing and also um, a park. <coughs> and um, it was formerly a military base. It had been for years. Um, and what I wanted to try and achieve with this, with this kind of ra rather miserable looking group of tents is how do you, can, can you actually, as a public artist, can you actually uh, create an artwork that had a de-gentrifying effect? Is that actually possible? Probably not. <laughs> but I just thought, how do you actually devalue <laughs> a, a public art commission? How do you actually create something that just, just uh, makes it... Um, uh, sort of devalues that process, and that was this was a kind of experiment of how how could you actually do that? I think, and that for me was a kind of utopian exercise, um, kind of critical utopian exercise of how do you actually develop a notion of degentrification or devaluing um, a process, a process in which I, as an artist, and maybe many of you in the audience who make public artworks, you we are inscribed into a gentrifying process, whether we like it or not. Now it's almost impossible to kind of de-link, unthread yourself from that process. But maybe it is possible, and maybe that po those possibilities are through kind of organizing social, uh, organi working together with friends on things that might not necessarily be seen as art, but might be to that group of people. So it's a, it's a, um, an, a notion of sort of commoning or, or, um, or um, communization that I think is very important in terms of way looking at how art might work in a different way that's not necessarily what we might see out here, for example. Um, this, is a, th this was something that was done um, some years ago in Roskilde. Um, and it's a, it, we, a group of artists were invited to, um, a group of artists were invited to make a, to participate in building, designing the infrastructure of a new town in Denmark, which was a kind of an also a kind of quite a utopian idea where you actually bring artists in at the very beginning of the design process to design parts of the infrastructure of a new town. And um, I was asked to design a small bridge, which was maybe uh, probably um, a couple of meters long pedestrian bridge. And um, through pushing and through chain transforming the sort of process, the social process of the commission, I was able to actually create a public space for, a, or an, an, an idea of a public space for this new town, because the, the master plan for the new town didn't actually have a public space. The only public space was the shopping mall. 
And the, so as, as my role as a public art um, artist, I could possibly just tweak the master plan slightly, just change it a little bit in order to create another type of space, another idea of another space where it wasn't necessarily related to commercial um, use. Um, it had another use, and that use was primarily to do with um, people um, meeting, but also um, the, the, the lake was designed, working together with landscape architect, designing these I two islands, which acted as a kind of filter for the rainwater that went, um, came off this new town into a fjord, and um, creating these two islands actually created more of a filtration system that was, wasn't there at the time. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a bus that I had um, traveled uh, through Europe in, um, which um, part, of, part of it, one third of it was a greenhouse, and um, it was a, a kind of also um, based on um, certain ideas from the 70s of a traveling bus. Um, it had a, a reading room, um, it was solar powered, um, on the roof, or the, all the electronics inside were solar powered. Had a, a reference library in it that you could Xerox uh, photocopy the books. And it traveled <laughs> uh, for two years uh, to different locations across Europe. Um, the, the idea of having a greenhouse moving actually doesn't really have any scientific function at all, really. Um, <laughs> it was just more of an experiment to see what would happen. Um, but apparently, from the way that plants reacted, they actually very th they thrived in that um, environment. And again, um, going back to anarchism, um, this is a very good uh, library in Lausanne in Switzerland. It's called CIRA, C-I-R-A. It's been there since the 50s, and it's basically, if you think you have an anarchistic project or, um, an, uh, or your, uh, you have an anarchist uh, publication, you send it to this, this library. The librarian looks at the book, but he or she decides whether it's anarchy, an if it represents <laughs> anarchism, if it does, it's catalogued and put on the shelf. If it doesn't, that person at the time just throws it in the bin. <laughs> so it actually has that, it, it doesn't have a particularly rigorous um, kind of policy. It's just really to do with the person sitting at that desk at the time and what they consider anarchism or not. It's, it's actually a, a very, very good uh, resource for looking at social struggles, um, exper utopian experiments, um, the feminism. It's actually a very, it's a great space. And what I did was I looked at that space in terms of pedagogy, what, uh, teaching, because within anarch the anarchist movement, there's a very strong tradition of teaching, looking at alternative methods of teaching, as well as ecology and so on. But for me, teaching was very important, um, very interesting, because it also related very strongly to my interests um, as a teacher as well. And together with my friend uh, Tilo Stiefert, we developed a kind of, uh, we took all the, um, aspects of that library about teaching and put them in this um, temporary um, workshop and library space in um, the museum in Geneva, the Contemporary Art Museum in Geneva. And this became a kind of their educational space. It was also a place structure, so you could actually play on it as well. Um, this is an idea, uh, this is again, uh, what, what, I t what I tend to do is work from the model to keep in pr more proposal, to, to to develop proposals that won't necessarily have to be made to sometimes seeing whether they could be made. Um, there are certain contradictions in that, but it's, for me, it just seems to have what's happened kind of more um, haphazardly rather than um, on a sort of idealistic or sort of programmatic way of working. Um, this is um, a proposal to take part of North London and remove any um, public planning or health and safety regulations from that space in order for people to actually, the people who can walk to it or bike to it, in order for them to actually start uh, developing urban planning uh, structures for themselves, or to start building the city for themselves, which actually comes again from the 70s, this notion of non-plan, but it also links to the adventure playground as well. And uh, this is the, what was mentioned before, um, this is a um, this idea um, in The Hague, developing these two urban farms in The Hague as a way, as a test bed for looking to see whether this utopian idea, this utopian biodynamic system of permaculture, whether that actually works on a long-term city-wide basis. Um, and so these are two test sites to see whether can permaculture, uh, as, a, as, a, as a strategy or as, a, as, a, as an idea, can it be implemented city-wide with, um, together with the urban planning department of the city. 
And um, we were given two sites by the city, two quite large sites, in order to develop together with uh, gardeners in The Hague to develop um, this, uh, these two gardens using permaculture principles. And um, one of the, 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 the whole, what actually became very interesting for me as an art project or as a project um, is that it, d it started to become a series of uh, layers of educational workshops. Um, every aspect of the project actually became a, a workshop. And um, from the whole, basically the whole design, the building, um, the, um, the activities that occurred on site were all um, became part of the workshop um, program of the, the institution that um, commissioned me, Strum, in The Hague. So these are some of just some of the designs and ideas that were developed by different students um, for the site. And eventually, um, we developed uh, this pavilion, which is the kind of meeting space and um, the uh, place where they keep their tools and have different educational workshops as well. And that every aspect of that building was also a layered uh, workshop, system of workshops. That's a straw baled um, building that uses a, um, this, uh, a series of timbers that are in a, uh, uh, a radial um, system that actually, uh, with their own weight, they actually create a roof. And in this, built, this type of structure has never been built before in the, Holland, in, in the Netherlands. It's actually considered illegal. It's not, a, it's not a recognized form of building. So we, through, because it was an art project, we could actually just slightly tweak the planning <laughs> so that we could actually make this building. And in terms of this, in terms of its design, in terms of low impact design, it's actually very important because it, it achieves a lot of things that the normal planning process isn't able to achieve. Um, one, some of the th ideas that come out of building this and the design of this structure is um, the, come from the utopian um, architect, um, Bruno Taut, and his ideas, um, some of the shapes. So to actually, pull it away from this kind of hobbit house to develop maybe more of a futuristic idea <laughs> of um, from this kind of eco-aesthetic of the hobbit house to try and maybe somehow merge it together with, um, mod with a kind of utopian modernism. <laughs> this is uh, Bruno Taut's building in Volkswede, which I think kind of is on the edge of that. Um, I mean, it's more like Teletubbies meets sort of <laughs> utopia, but... This is his um, very famous glass pavilion, which was a temporary building. Most of the buildings that he made, he didn't make very many buildings, but most of the famous ones were for exhibitions. So kind of, a, in a way, he was kind of like an artist, kind of developing temporary structures, tweaking and pushing um, um, various ideas of design and possibilities. And for me, that's a very important way of looking at how, what artists can achieve. So uh, this is the building that we designed in the end. Um, and also the permaculture, is based on a system of, I mean, I'm also very critical of permaculture, but that's one of the reasons why I wanted to develop this idea was to see how does it actually work? Can you actually take it into another, into a larger or into a different type of uh, system, which is the urban planning system of the city? That in itself offers up contradictions because maybe it shouldn't be there anyway. But if you take the transition town movement as an idea, then these things do actually have to be developed further and larger. And then finally, um, just very quickly, uh, my teaching, um, what I do here in Denmark, <laughs> is very much informed by uh, my interest in anarchism and the writings of Colin Ward, for example, but also Bell Hooks, Paulo Freire, um, the also the idea of looking at the city as a, a system of connected ecologies, uh, multiple ecologies that are connected. The city is a space of multiple spaces that are all interconnected as well as um, different social groups and so on and activities. And that's something that I, I develop as an idea with students together with art, specifically art students. These are actually, this is in Chicago where I developed a, pro a seminar um, for a semester, but these are actually, because it was a university, these are actually economic students and um, urban planning students. So it, using this uh, different idea of teaching, um, you can actually uh, reach out to different kind of groups of students who wouldn't necessarily be doing this in their normal everyday classroom. This is actually them looking at the kitchen waste that they had just um, thrown in the bin in the canteen. We went to actually see where it went and so on. This is a very, very famous composting place in Chicago. 
again, looking at um, 70s experiments, 70s communes together in detail, like visiting people, interviewing them. This is the, um, this used to be called the Farallones Institute. It's the Occidental Arts um, Center now, I think it's called. Looking at social housing, um, looking at housing experiments, squats, um, different ways of living um, in terms of city living, particularly city living. Uh, different cooperative, farm, to cooperative farms um, that it still exist. Um, looking at um, unexplored or not un kind of uh, s parts of the city that you wouldn't necessarily in, um, have a look at. Um, um, parts of uh, the industrialized city. Working with other students from high schools, like bringing art schools together with high school kids. This is a very interesting school called the City as School in Manhattan where kids actually go out and work with different parts, of the different people in the city to develop their own coursework. So they actually, the high school kids, develop their own um, curriculum, if you like. And this, um, I worked together with these high school kids um, and the students from Copenhagen on um, a temporary art school um, or a temporary campus at the in, in the space in Queens and w over a summer, a period of summer, with workshops and different um, uh, courses and so on that were all free, but also set up um, on a kind of free school model. And then finally, what I've been trying to introduce it to C Copenhagen, the art school in Copenhagen, is a permaculture course as well. So they're actually learning, the art students are also learning um, permaculture as, uh, as part of the curriculum. So they're actually learning this kind of... Uh, um, other method, if you like. That hasn't, that sort of has its successes and doesn't. It sort of goes in and out. But to bring two separate kind of ideas together, <coughs> um, for me, is a kind of interesting experiment, like uh, guard, uh, permaculture and art together. Um, it also, the two different types of teaching are very, create interesting contradictions. And some of the, the techniques that we use actually come also, again, come from the 70s, but also come out of utopian impulse. So one of the early um, consciousness raising groups and the, the, sort of, uh, sort of the beginnings of the feminist movement in the 70s. And we actually use a lot of their techniques that they developed at the time. Um, we're close to ideas of um, a group, group uh, therapy, but also um, ideas of uh, um, kind of, again, this idea of communalization, of, of working together on the curriculum, working together on um, uh, discussion. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, anything else? Any questions? Thanks so much for the talk. Um, you made a couple of very provocative statements in the beginning that I wanted to yep. play out a little bit. The first um, is the connection you make between Fourier and Richard Florida, yeah. um, which basically says that utopia can play on either team. Um, yeah, I think so. That it's not inherently progressive, even though we tend to deal with it as though it has some kind of primarily progressive potential. So that's one thing. I wanted you to just spin out a little bit more. Um, and then somehow in relation to that, your comments also about Constant and New Babylon, mm -hmm. um, because he spent a lot of time talking about the element of surprise in that. And he would say things like, well, the point of this part is that you go around this corner and you see a play of light on the facade and it amazes you. Yeah. And that's the utopian charge of it. And um, I'm not sure exactly what relation to make between those two points, but somehow there's, um, I don't know. Well, uh, the, the idea of uh, Fourier and Rich, well, this idea of a progressive idea of, I, I, I'm sure Richard Florida thinks he's very progressive. Right. Uh, he comes out, he actually comes out of a left-wing tradition. He was taught by Marxists mm -hmm. at CUNY, I think, CUNY Grad Center. He was taught by, like, uh, David Harvey and... Uh, um, uh, Marcuse, who was there, Peter Marcuse. S and he, they actually see him as kind of Darth Vader. He was the guy that kind of went wrong. <laughs> and, 
but I'm sure that he actually believes he what he does is a very progressive, very enlightening thing, emancipatory thing. But um, and I think that utopia can go both ways like that. I mean, it can do, it can, you know, it can switch sides quite easily and quite quickly. I think, and maybe Constant did that as well, or could possibly because those ideas of kind of living with other people. I think also you would be homeless in his system. You wouldn't actually have a kind of dwelling. You would just drift through corridors endlessly with other people. And that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't personally think that was a very utopian idea of living. But maybe that's the thing about utopia. It, it isn't really about this end point. It's more about the process, the journey. And that is a place where that's where the sort of the contradictions and the questions are, and, the, and the kind of emancipation sort of or the politicization kind of unfolds somehow or well, that's the space that that's the important space where, where you get to doesn't really matter like the utopian space at the end is maybe kind of irrelevant it's more of that always becoming that's the more important part right but meanwhile you have the, con the classic conditions of the precariat yeah people who have who are like permanently underclass yeah. the fabulous because they're good yeah. And so it's, it's like this big contradiction that we're living with right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, that, that's why I, um, I mean, I, I actually think we're living in, in very exciting times. Um, um, precarity is, of course, um, it, it's sort of, it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's something that is in almost, it touches every part of your life. Um, uh, and it's a very, it can be, um, you know, it's kind of, it does have, it is also creates misery for thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people. Um, and, but I think somehow also that idea of a pre precarious kind of existence does come, also comes out of the utopian idea. I mean, if you read, for example, Capital, Marx's Capital, mm -hmm. that is that he actually believes that that's a sort of capitalist utopian text, that his description of capitalism, is he, that's his idea of a utopian idea of what capitalism might look like, or that's what capitalists thought the world would look like, a bit like how various neo neoliberal writers think that if you develop this kind of neoliberal system of precarity, of uh, free trade, we will have a very utopian um, society. But of course that's, for me, that's actually kind of not a ple very pleasant place to live. But f for the, the people, developed this idea of neo neoliberal ideology in Chicago, some of them from Chicago, they actually believed that that was kind of a utopian dream. And some people still do think that, strangely. <laughs> Thanks for a very inspiring talk. Um, I wondered um, wh when you um, explore these um, um, playgrounds yeah. um, as a kind of uh, um, interesting sites for um, inventing new kinds of architecture, less controlled architecture. Yeah. Do you then also explore um, childhood as um, utopia? Um, you know, the ideas of um, um, creative forces existing in childhood and being later on suppressed? Uh, yes, I mean, that also that's something that um, is, is written quite a lot in terms of anarchist literature, it's actually that, those ideas. And that, that is something that I do look into quite. I just, I, 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 um, I uh, yeah, it is. But the, th the thing is, a lot of these projects are actually quite um, labor intensive. So it's actually quite, like, for example, there are certain things about you. I started looking at adventure playgrounds, just specifically those types of playgrounds. But through the uh, development of that, I started looking at other types of playscapes. So I started looking into like um, uh, um, Asama Noguchi, for example, or different notions of play, different playscapes, different, pl different notions of play in the city. And that's kind of branched out into those different places, but it, that actually is a very slow process um, to do that. So, and also the, le the whole legal structure of how those playgrounds exist that's a whole other sort of element of, of, the res of research that I haven't really got into very deeply. And also notions of childhood. And um, that is something that is just now beginning to kind of, for me, I'm just beginning to develop that as a, as a, as a sort of field, but it's not 
something that I, I know as well as, for example, the, just the basic uh, adventure playground and structure. I, mean, I know how children use them and the kind of different social interactions that occur within them. Um, but it's not, you know, these, there, are a lot, there are so many different kind of uh, layers of, a, of a, this onion around play that it's um, quite difficult to actually like, develop, go deeper into those things. Okay, I think Richard first. <laughs> I really like the idea of de de gentrification. I think that's fantastic. But it struck me that uh, there was some consistency between that and w the way you represent your teaching, uh, and also the idea of introducing zones of disorder mm -hmm. into North London, which you, you, you can definitely use. Uh, but I wondered, um, is it possible um, in the environment in which you? teach to to introduce elements of genuine disorder and and are they do you find them creatively interesting or productive in in terms of how you understand your pedagogy because in, in the environment in which i work we're desperately in need of disorder but yeah. we we're so regulated that it, <laughs> it's a struggle to sustain it in any well, kind of level. We, we have it but it's very difficult to sustain yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Anne and I work in quite an interesting institution because it's the Royal Danish Acad Art Academy, but and it's in an old castle. But it's it actually <laughs> it's there's a sort of the contradiction is that it still it still works little. It's changing now a little bit, but it still works on this old Beaux Arts tradition of the prof prof professor and the Meister class, and. But what most of the teachers in that institution have been able to do is actually kind of twist that idea to kind of to actually contemporize that idea to, to avoid a kind of modular grid-like structure of education, taking the Beaux-Arts model and actually creating maybe more of a playful space by relinquishing the professor role and creating maybe more of a sort of softer space of where students actually work together on the curriculum and des develop their education in conversation uh, together as like where the students are actually learning together, but also where the professor actually kind of takes off that professor cloak. I mean, it's impossible, it's completely impossible, it is impossible to do that totally, but that's becoming much easier within this institution to do that um, than say, I mean, I've taught in, in UK art schools and it would be impossible to do that in those spaces because they're so, heavily defined by this grid of the module and the workshop and the seminar that, um, you c that which doesn't exist yet in our institution. I mean, it's, we're on the cusp of a change, but we have a kind of, a kind of a sort of freedom. It's not freedom, but it's a kind of closer maybe to a more um, experimental space than it's possible in a UK art school, for example. But I think that's really to do with this absurdly, because it's related to this paternalistic model from whenever that was, the 1700s or whenever it started. <laughs> Thank you. Um, your work's really inspiring. Thank um, you. And one of the things that's so inspiring is that I can't see, I can't figure out whether you're an activist or an artist or an architect or a farmer. Um, <laughs> maybe not the farmer, but um, uh, and so it's all sort of blurred together. And you know, I think Richard did a really good job in the last talk talking about some of the problems might be of sort mm. of collapsing those. So, what are the strengths of collapsing them? Oh yeah, I mean, I think the, s the strengths are that you can actually maybe you can you're more able to make changes. I think from my experience, than you would be necessarily as an engineer or as an urban planner. You, you're, because you're sort of dancing in between, and there, of course that has its problems as well, um, because you, you can, like, you know, it's a kind of cliche, but you actually bec you become sort of, you, you're very good at lots of things, but you're not very good at one thing. And, um, but because you can kind of dance at the edges of these contradictions, um, and these different fields, you are able to actually shift and change things a little in a little bit easier way than if you um, were, like for example, as an engineer, if I, 
engineers, the engineers that I know, and I spend quite a lot of time with engineers and, and architects and urban planners, they, it's very difficult for them to leave their field and meet a poet or work with a musician or, but for an artist it's actually very easy to do that. And I think that mm -hmm. the ability to do that um, creates more a kind of interesting possibilities or transformative possibilities, um, more so than, um, but again, then you actually start getting into this kind of, because then um, taking that to a kind of extreme or a, a, a to its end point, you could actually end up with Richard Florida's sort of creative uh, person who basically um, create, you're basically creating a new class of creatives who kind of feel they can just do whatever they want. Um, because I get, I, for example, I get, um, f because actually this is directly linked to Richard Florida, because he, he's been taken so seriously by various, for those of you who don't know who Richard Florida is, he's a, is he a sociologist? He's a sociologist, and he um, ha wrote two very influential books. One of them was, the first one's called The, um, the Rise of the Creative Class, I think it's called. And he um, defi coined this term creative class. He also created a whole kind of very simple, uh, s very simple, it's actually a, a, a very humorous book, but all for the wrong reasons. If you read it, it, ma it actually makes you laugh out loud at some of his ideas, but these ideas have been taken very seriously by local communities and governments where they actually now are trying to implement his ideas. And um, the ideas are about trying to create more friendly, I mean, they sound great. If you describe them, you think, well, it actually sounds really good. But when you look at it closely, you, really re you, re you realize that he's actually developing uh, literally a new class, and that's the idea, the, the, the creative class, where you're actually creating a whole, whole new distinct class system which oppresses another group of people who become the service industry to that group of artists, musicians, and so on. I mean, his ideas are to actually create cities, which um, he calls them the three, t using the three T's, I think, transform, I can never remember what they are, but he has all these like ca catchphrases and keywords. And it's, you basically make, a, if, your fr if your city can tick off these different boxes, if it's friendly for women, if it's friendly for um, gay people, for people of color, um, for artists, basically you've won. You're, the, you're in the top 20 of those things. And he has a list that he publishes. But what that also does is make cities uh, incredibly competitive, where they have to have a museum, they have to have this, they have to have that. Um, and you create this kind of very, um, for me, working in this, in within the kind of urban planning, uh, public art system, it actually be, it's actually very problematic, this idea where cities actually have to compete with each other because you create quite kind of, you get very poor cities and you get extremely rich cities depending on how competitive they are within this system. And it's not actually equally, like the cash isn't equally distributed. And also, as an artist, you get, p you get a city phoning up saying, we, can you come and help us with this sort of depressed zone that we have? And it's like, well, I'm not really trained to do that. But because of reading Richard Frost, they think that's what you can do. Okay. So that's actually just one of the funny contradictions. Mm. Okay, we just have time for two uh, short questions. One for David and Rasmus. Uh, okay, it's very brief. Um, fantastic presentation. Uh, it's kind of Thank you. Um, I could say a lot more than I will. Um, I really agree with almost everything you said. And, and, and um, to me, those spaces that you showed, the, the playground, for example, are utopian spaces. They're utopian processes, but they're spaces that are in process and in progress, and that's that's why they're utopian, as opposed to being close to the future. Um, and, and the kind of utopianism I'd argue for does that. It, it creates spaces where you, you can be open to the future, but uh, and the, I think they're anarchist spaces, but the, the one worry I have about this, um, I guess it's what I call the Margaret Atwood problem. I don't know if you've read Oryx and Crake at all, but this yeah. dystopian novel where Basically, the, the rich live in gated communities, um, and everyone else is allowed to fend for themselves in the Plebelands, they're called. Um, and she doesn't sketch out what the Plebelands are like, except sort of suggests they're quite exciting and there's a bit of danger there. <laughs> uh, and I would like to imagine they might develop you know, exciting adventure playgrounds like and so on. But at the same time, there is a huge problem of capital. And how, d how do we try and develop these great spaces, but at the same time say, no to capital because you know capitalists might say well this is great we can just leave them to get on with it we don't have to give them anything we don't have to have a welfare state because they can all do it themselves how do, how do we well that, that's actually things? what's happening in the uk right yeah, now absolutely. um a this idea of the big society <laughs> um it's basically an an idea of uh, actually going back to a th thatcherite idea of an entrepreneurial society where we basically all have to kind of compete with each other 
without any state funding at all, without any welfare at all. And um, which is kind of maybe also a utopian idea. Um, but it's, I think it's actually, very, uh, it's actually a very dangerous one because for me, the idea of a big society is where wealth, where you have a state support system um, or you have a system that supports you. Where it doesn't necessarily have to be the state, but it, there has to be some kind of like um, structure. I mean, that doesn't sound very anarchistic, but anarchism yeah. does actually include certain kind of ideas of structure, you know? social Hassan. support. Hassan? Um, thank you. Let me play the devil's advocate and say that a lot of these thoughts are very beautiful, but they have all been tried. Mm. And uh, making, trying to, to remove power structures, only make them invisible and make oppression even worse because it's not really able, you're not able to fight it because these yeah. self-organized groups and, and uh, collective processes and so on, they will always congeal and be established a sort of dominance yeah. system in them. So how, how, how would you say that uh, these kind of projects are not just repeating the mistakes of the 70s? Well, I wouldn't necessarily what hap say what happened in the 70s were mistakes. I mean, they don't, of course, there were lots of different, there were lots of different projects. I don't think you can really generalize the 70s as a, for a failure. There were lots of different things that happened, which I think were very important. But I don't think I actually mentioned any removal of um, power within this talk. It's still there. I mean, I said as a teacher, you ca I cannot never say that I'm not the professor, because I'm, I'm paid as an employee to be there. So the power is always there yeah. on my behalf, but it's part of a discussion. It's, part, it's, kind of, uh, it's actually made, in a way, more clear, because it's actually part of the process of the teaching. It's part of the discussion. It's actually to unpack who I am as well, uh, who, what my role is within that process of, of, of the classroom. Um, it's not just me telling the students, this is what you have to do. It's actually saying, well, uh, this is my position. That's your position, or let's talk about that. Let's def try and define that. And what are we going to do about it? And that's kind of, it's more of a process of that sort rather than me just sort of pretending I'm not the teacher or, or not, I'm not paid to be there. Um, but a lot, of the, a lot of the things that I showed you, like, for example, the Adventure Playground, I said that there is actually a paid employee there, uh, usually paid for by the state, that it's not just kids playing on their own. It's actually, um, there's actually a, there's a structure there. So um, I didn't actually say that power was removed somehow. It was kind of just maybe looked at in a different way. Okay, I'm going to exercise some power now and <laughs> say thank you to Nils. Um, thank you.